Let's see, so in this video, we're going to discover the normal approximation for the binomial distribution. So in this part, we'll just kind of talk through this quickly. You can fill it in later yourselves. So I have here, you can see the distributions for a binomial distribution with p equals 0.3 and different sample sizes there. So this first one, this is a binomial distribution for n equals 6 and p equals 0.3. So all of these have p equals 0.3. But for n equals 6, it looks like we are definitely not symmetric, it's not symmetric. We look very discrete, there's only like 6 bars. But when we do n equals 12, it looks like we're becoming almost a little bit more symmetric and the bars seem closer together. By the time you get to n equals 120, notice it's very symmetric and the bars are closer together. And if you get to n equals 1200, the bars are really, really close, it's very symmetric and what does it look like? It looks normal. So again, you start off looking not symmetric and also very discrete, only a couple bars, and then it gets to where it looks more and more continuous and it looks like a bell and it's very symmetric. So that was interesting. Let's see if that happens on other ones. So here's a different binomial distribution. This one has p equals 0.9 for all of them, but different values of n. So n equals 5, again, definitely, definitely not symmetric n equals 15 still doesn't look very symmetric, n equals 150 we're getting close to symmetric, and we'll say, but by the time we get to n equals 1500, it looks normal. Now when I say normal, I mean specifically the normal distribution. So for those big sample sizes, or for those big sizes of n, it looks very normal. Okay, and here's just one more, so this one starts with p equals 0.5, so we start off kind of symmetric, but it doesn't really look like a bell curve, but by the time you get to n equals 1000, it looks very, very normal. And so it turns out this is something that actually happens every time, and we have very nice theoretical reasons for it. But it turns out any time you have a binomial distribution, if you have a large n, you can use the normal distribution to approximate it. Okay, so let's see. The normal approximation to the binomial distribution. So let's recall, if x is a binomial distribution with n and p, then the expected value is always n times p and the variance is n times p times 1 minus p. Now a binomial distribution can be approximated, so it's not exactly the same, but you can approximate and get pretty close, by a normal distribution with the same mean and variance. Now when we say the same mean and variance, we mean the mean is going to be n p, and the variance is going to be n p 1 minus p, since that's the mean and variance for binomial distribution. So x will be approximately distributed normal with the mean and variance. Now this approximate, approximation works well for large values of n. Okay. Specifically, our rule of thumb is that it will work well if you have n times p is at least 5 and n times 1 minus p is at least 5. And you do have to check both of these. Not just one, but both. So let's suppose that x is distributed binomially, or binomial, binomial n is 20, p is 0.5. So let's write that down. Now let's first check and see what n times p is. So n times p is 20 times 0.5, which equals 10. That's bigger than 5, so we'll check that off. And n, n times 1 minus p equals 20 times, coincidentally, again, it's going to be 10. Okay, so both of those are bigger than 5, so we can use the normal approximation. So we could find the probability that x is less than or equal to 7 by using the binomial distribution. And we just plug everything into the binomial formula, but we have to do that for 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 7, and that takes a while but you get 0 0.1315. So instead, we could find it using the normal distribution with our mean, again, is going to be 10, and our standard deviation is the square root of variance, so the square root of n times p times 1, is 1 minus p is 2.23. So to find the probability with the normal distribution, we would just do standardize this. So we'll do 7 minus 10 divided by 2.23, look it up on our CDF table, or our normal table, and we get 0 0.0895. So that's fairly close, but not 
Exact. So it turns out, we figured out that the normal approximation works a lot better if we use what's called the continuity correction. To do this, instead of finding the probability that x is less than equal to 7, we'd use the normal distribution and find the probability that x is greater than or equal to 7.5. And we'll explain that in a minute. Okay, and so you do the exact same thing, but instead of 7, you do 7.5, and we get 0.1317. Look how close that is. It's not exact, and we don't expect it to be exact because we're just approximating. But it's pretty close. So why do we use that continuity correction? There's two different graphs here because sometimes they graph it with really wide lines. But in reality, each probability is actually a very small line because it's only at 7. But the normal distribution is continuous. So it was finding all of these probabilities here. But that doesn't match up exactly with the normal curve because it's doing all of the normal probabilities. So there's some probabilities here and here and here and everything. So what we'll do to kind of make it all work exactly is we come over just a little bit. We always make our area just a little bit bigger and then it turns out to give us the correct answer. So let's look at this applet real quick. So in this applet, I can change P, and I can also change N, and you can see how the shape of the distribution changes when I do that. So notice, here, N is equals 36, P equals 0.62, it looks fairly normal. And I can drag my probabilities over, and it changes a little bit, but it still looks pretty normal. But notice, what happens if I drag too far this way? About right here, it says, warning, N times 1 minus P is less than equal to 10. Now, some textbooks say 10, which is why this one does. Our textbook just said it needs to be at least 5. Then really, you're close enough. But once you get to that point, notice it's starting to look less normal. And if P was even higher, again, this n times 1 minus P is getting even smaller. And so it doesn't look very normal, right? But even with that high P, if I make my n high enough, eventually that warning is going to disappear. And that warning disappears, and it still looks normal again. Or if I make P really small, when I get over here, it's going to not be very symmetric or look normal again. But if I make N look bigger, or make N bigger, once again, it looks normal. So as long as N is big enough, it's going to be a normal distribution. Back to our notes, let's learn about the continuity correction. So in your textbook, you have these rules if you want to find the probability that x is less than or equal to some number, you'll find the probability that x is less than or equal to x plus 0.5. Or if it's a greater than, you'll do probability that x is greater than or equal to x minus 0.5. Now, I spent a lot of years just trying to memorize that and look at it every time. It's a lot easier to just memorize this. I always think of it as I add on 0.5 to try and be safe to make my region bigger. So I'll show you how we do that in our examples. If x is distributed binomial, n equals 14, and p equals 0.4, find the probability that x is between 3 and 6 by using the normal approximation. Okay. So first, let's check and make sure that we can, that these numbers are big enough. So n times p is 14 times 0.4. which is 5.6, and that's at least 5, so we're good there. And n times 1 minus p is going to be 14 times 0 0.6, which is 8.4, and that's also bigger than 5. So we're good to use the normal distribution. We've checked that n is big enough. Now we're supposed to be finding the probability that x is between 3 and 6. And I could just use those numbers. But we know that the continuity correction gives us better results. So if I want the probability between 3 and 6, what you want to do is you always try and make that, so we're trying to find this, but we want to make that region bigger to be on the safe side, kind of, if you will. So instead, let's look at it from 2.5 to 6.5. So I actually subtracted here and added here, but instead of trying to think, do I subtract or add? I just said, let's make it bigger on each side. And I make it bigger by going from 2.5 to 6.5. So let's instead use 2.5 to 
to 6.5, just with the continuity correction. And then before I can find these probabilities, I need to know what is my mean and standard deviation so I can standardize. So I should have done that first, but we'll just move it down and go ahead and find that. So what is my mean going to be? We said the mean is always going to be NP for binomial. So NP, we already found that 14 times 0.4 is 5.6. And standard deviation is the square root of NP times 1 minus P. So the square root of 14 times 0.4 times 0.6 gives me 1.833. Now that we know those, we can go ahead and standardize. So we'll do each number minus the mean, which is 5.6, divided by the standard deviation, which is 1.833. This is less than or equal to, now we'll do x minus mu over sigma, because that's our formula to get z, x minus mean over standard deviation. Standard deviation, 6.5 minus our mean of 5.6 over 1.833 gives me the probability that we're looking to try and find the probability that z is between negative 1.69 and 0.49. And then when we use our normal distribution, okay, so here's z equals negative 1.69, here's z equals 0.49, and we're looking for the area in between, how do we do that? You go to your table, and we'll look up our 0.49 first, and then we'll go to our table and we'll look up the negative 1.69, and we'll subtract them. So we always do the bigger one first, just like any time we use CDFs. So going to my normal table, we're looking for 0.49, so 0.4, go across to the 9 column, we're at 0.6879. And for my 1.69, negative 1.69, so negative 1.6, the 9 will be way over here, so 0 0.0455. And this gives me 0.6424, so that's our approximation. No, it's the exact with 0.65266, so we're pretty close. Not exact, but approximations are supposed to be exact. In a test for a particular illness, a false positive result is obtained in about 1 in 125 administrations of the test. If the test is administered to 15,000 people, estimate the probability of there being more than 135 false positive results. And here's our exact binomial probability. So first of all, let's see, we're looking at this, we're administering a test, we have a false positive, so we're either going to talk about like false positive or not, okay, and I think everything should fit for binomial, we know in advance that we're looking at 15,000 people, the probability equals 1 out of 125, okay, and that should stay the same, each person should be independent of the next person, Everything fits for this to be binomial. And we're trying to find the probability that there are more than 135. Now, if you were trying to do this with a binomial distribution, you would have to be adding up literally over 100 probabilities to try and do this. Okay, and that just doesn't really make sense to try and do by hand. With a calculator or a computer, sure, but not by hand. So it really makes sense to use the normal distribution here. Now, one thing that we have to pay attention to when we work with a discrete distribution is it says more than 135, which means that the 135 is not included. For discrete, we would want to change that to x is greater than or equal to 136. It doesn't matter for continuous, but it does matter for discrete, so make sure you change that to x greater than or equal to 136. Before we try and use the normal approximation, let's check if n is big enough. By checking n times p, which is 15,000, times 1 over 125 is 120. Well, that's definitely at least 5. And n times 1 minus p is going to be 15,000 times 1 minus 1 over 125 
which is going to be 14880, and that's really definitely big enough. So it's big enough, we can go ahead and do this. Let's see, let's find our expected value, or our mean, depending on which way you prefer to write it. And that's for binomial, just n times p. So again, n times p, we just found that right there. That is 120. And our variance is n times p times 1 minus p. Let's see, so 15,000. times 1 over 125, times 1 minus 1 over 125, which gives me 119.04. And if you want the standard deviation, you take the square root of that, which is 10.91. So we found our expected value, our variance, and our standard deviation. Now let's focus on our probabilities. So we were actually looking for Here's x equals 136. We want everything greater than that. So that means we'll need to make our region a little bit bigger. And how do you make it bigger? By going to 135.5. So we're looking for the probability that x is greater than or equal to 135.5. And we'll use our normal distribution. So to do normal, you have to standardize by doing x minus the mean over the standard deviation. So 135.5 minus our mean of 120 over the standard deviation of 10.91, which gives us the probability that z is greater than or equal to 1.42. Let's see, those are my x's. Let's draw one for our z's now. So here's z equals 1.42, and we want the area to the right. Now, if I was to go and look this up on my table, we're looking for 1.42. So here's 1.4 here. Here's the 0.2 here. It looks like we're intersecting at 0.92222. But that's the area to the left. My normal table always gives me the area to the left. So this is 0.9222, which means the area to the right is 1 minus 0.9222 or 0 0.0778. Now we would write this as if we find, want the probability for greater than, we know we have to do 1 minus the CDF evaluated at a 1.42. So 1 minus 0 0.9222 gives me 0 0.0778.